The following presentation was recorded at the 2017 ANZIC's Safety and Quality Conference. Uh, hello. Um, hopefully you weren't there to hear my earlier talk, but if you have, I apologise for repeating some content. Um, it's interesting, I reflect back, uh, not from my time in Safer Care Victoria, but as my time as a rural patient and thinking about when I was camping very late one night and having a ruptured ovarian cyst and having no mobile reception at the top of the mountain where we were camping until we got to the bottom of the mountain, finally calling Triple O um, uh, and to find out what to, where to go. And the response was, the only ambulance is about to pass you on the road that you are intersecting at the moment, so follow it. <laughs> And so um, that was my introduction to some of the rural challenges of, um, of access, uh, uh, but a really good outcome because I'm standing here today. But I wanted to share with you a bit of the information that we managed uh, to understand in a bit more detail around what rural challenges um, our ICUs are facing in terms of clinical deterioration. Um, and I think there's still stuff we don't know and more questions we need to ask, but this has been a really eye-opening and interesting process. So I want to talk to you about the collaborative that we ran with the 15 health services who responded to an expression of interest, and we gave them a tiny, tiny amount of funding to do this. Um, but we had a 50-50 split between rural and metropolitan health services who were involved. Uh, two were private, and we had a structured breakthrough collaborative model. Um, but what was really interesting uh, when we brought everyone together who hadn't really come together before around this topic was uh, the learnings in terms of uh, what was actually going on in their ICU. And I think initially the folk way up there 600 kilometres from Melbourne in Mildura thought that the folk down here... Uh, in, in Melbourne uh, really had very, very different uh, uh, experiences and they certainly uh, knew that their metropolitan colleagues had a lot more resource. But I guess, you know, the question then remains, um, what do you think? Do you think um, that they had very different uh, challenges and very different issues? And if you think yes, can you raise your hand? So uh, we thought that too initially, but uh, as we went through it, um, you know, we looked at the, the data and you would be right. And in fact, one of our busiest hospitals um, over, met over five years that's been analysed, you know, they've got over 7,000 met calls a year and some of the smaller um, units have certainly got much less than that uh, per annum. But... Um, you know, going in with this expectation, we were really surprised that the true answer was maybe yes and maybe no. And what we learnt was actually some of the issues were really, really similar. Uh, and a lot of the things that we've heard here, apart from the distance, apart from the volume of uh, how many calls you're responding to, the issues of engaging other stakeholders who are really quite difficult to uh, get around the table was exactly the same, uh, whether you were uh, regional or metropolitan. Um, the other issue about addressing um, end of life and advanced care planning was also a very resounding similar issue across the two. So I wanted to share with you what that actually looks like. Um, if you've uh, been to my earliest talk, um, we did ask the... Uh, I shared this earlier, and we did ask each ICU to interrogate their data. So one thing we do know is that there were more MET calls in 2014-15 in Victoria than there were patients admitted to ICU. So that in itself is saying that this is a brand new, uh, well not brand new, but it's, a, a, it's quite a significant work stream that exists within um, hospitals. Uh, and so we were also able to calculate across those 40, uh, 40 at the time, ICUs, that a MET call was happening every 15.9 minutes in Victoria. But what was consistent, and this is aggregated from our 15 sites, is that, you know, most of the uh, MET calls were still happening in the acute area. Um, the split uh, was almost 50-50 between medical and surgical. And certainly, predominantly, most of our patients, no matter where you were, remained on the ward post-MET. Uh, and are significantly along the 
um, the, most of the volume of the Met calls were happening during the day. But, you know, we did accept that more were happening uh, during the day, but equally around 40% overnight. So I guess this is where one of the challenges was a little bit different between uh, metropolitan and regional, was that metropolitan, a lot of the services have... Uh, different resourcing in terms of they might have an overnight resource to respond to met calls, whereas um, it might be uh, you know, resting on the shoulders of the in charge nurse in the small uh, regional ICU. So that actually was a bit of a concern for us, and certainly um, as you would be too, if you're leaving the most sickest and acutest patients to uh, to go to the rest of the hospital to respond to um, other patients when you're not quite sure what the reason for deterioration was. Um, it, it's just amazing that there hasn't been more sentinel events that have occurred because of that. So what we also did was uh, we turned the national consensus statement into a self-assessment tool and uh, we took the two major elements, so clinical processes and organisational prerequisites, and we turned it into a radar graph or a spider graph. Now, this is uh, kind of a reflection of all of them and all of their responses. And so you could argue that, well, ICUs did this self-assessment, so of course they're going to say they're quite good on the rapid response and the escalation of care. But the um, interesting thing uh, was that you know, there were certainly lots and lots of areas of opportunity and deficits. And I would say if you repeated this in your organisation, it might actually look something similar. Um, but I wanted to show you what the actual difference was in the breakdown between regional and metropolitan. So here we have an example of four regional ICUs. Um, the name of their organisation has been taken off this data. But you can see that uh, there is variation uh, in terms of uh, basically how well developed their MET system is or isn't. And so consistently you can see that the rapid response uh, seems to uh, rate quite highly. So there is something in place. Um, however, in terms of uh, how it's responded to or, um, you know, the communication that happens between teams, you know, that is quite variable uh, across the, the sites. Um, I can say that um, this, this one here is actually a larger regional organisation, so probably have a little bit more resource than the others. But I can also say that the distance from um, um, Melbourne is significant as well. So um, that is quite interesting in terms of what's happening there. And I suspect that it's actually around the clinical leadership um, that happens in that particular area. So what does that look like when you compare it to metropolitan ICUs? And I guess hmm, for want of some uh, pieces of variation, they actually look really similar. I don't know if you disagree with that, but um, again, you can see there's lots of issues around the technological um, education, particularly organisational structures. So there's similar issues across. and. Without having this um, quantified, just in terms of the way uh, people were sharing in those workshops, what issues they were actually facing, you know, it was such a revelation, and Karen's nodding her head because she was in the room at the time, it was such a revelation for people to say, oh my God, this is happening in my regional health service, and you guys are dealing with it, and you've got twice the amount of staff that we have. So um, that's why I actually say yes and no. The excellent thing uh, through the collaborative, apart from the, the whole process of going through the data and finding out where the gaps were and what the opportunities were, where people will be able to say, you know, hey, we've got that issue you're dealing with, we've got it sorted, and please take our, um, our tools and, and techniques and, and feel free to exploit that in your organisation. Um, the other thing was it really enabled people and gave people in the regional units the confidence to go back and really go internally and say, hey, you know, we should be dealing with this at a governance level. It's not just the ICU. So that was also extremely positive as well. Um, so the next question we also had was uh, what is the variation around what people are collecting around MET calls and what you've got there is a smatter of tertiary metropolitan and also regional ICUs and um, at, the, at the most you've got this tertiary ICU collecting 60 data points versus uh, one of the regional 
the two of the regional units are collecting less than 20. I don't actually know what the right number of data points actually is, but I think this is the piece of work that we are continuing to develop because we want to, able to, we want to be able to support the regional organisations that just drown under data collection and trying to put reports together. But equally, our, our metropolitan um, ICUs also don't have that sorted particularly, although this one does. They're very lucky. So if I had to tease out um, basically what was similar and what was uh, different, I would say that one point of difference uh, between the two was multiple met calls. So, you know, in the organisation that's got uh, 7,000 plus and even those at the 3,000 mark, it's not unusual that you can have um, three to four met calls happening within a 15 minute time frame. Um, but that's not to say that doesn't happen regionally and of course the, the challenges are, are quite significant and um, I did hear last week that uh, you know that became a reality in a rural um, special care n um, nursery in terms of there were uh, four met calls for patients, for babies that um, ended up needing assistance and it was only happenstance and it was only luck that they happened to have a paediatric grand round on that day. So they had three paediatricians in the hospital. Otherwise you can imagine how chaotic that would have been. So I think there's definitely heaps of opportunity for us to look at how we can um, uh, better resource to be able to deal with multiple METs. The hours of the team definitely different and through this process um, there's at least two uh, organisations who have been able to up their resource uh, simply because they've been able to make the argument and make the case. But certainly, you know, the governance and the no feedback loop uh, that were consistent on across both um, areas. And I think the disconnect between home teams and patient outcomes, you know, um, some of the some of the regional units would say that you know their their home teams wouldn't even know that a met call had happened to one of their patients uh, in that time, and they had been in there and um, you know almost saved the day really. So really trying to support people to be able to con make those connect dots, um, and they're connecting the black dots. But I guess we're also interested as a as a um, as safer care Victoria to connect some of those white dots. Um, and particularly around some of those issues that are pre-met and also at the met phase. So there's lots of work to do, which is always good news, um, but we just we can't take our eyes off the ball, we can't drop the ball. So uh, here's uh, an example of some of our workshops there where we've brought people together and we, we really did that deliberately and we forced people to sit at different tables and not just within their own health service because we wanted that cross-pollination and that worked extremely well. We also offered capability um, to a number of our ICUs because we wanted to um, support them to not only use a process of uh, continuous improvement for this piece but also take it back um, for other pieces as well. So that's been incredibly useful as we've gone along. So some of the, these are some of the key improvements that people have actually done through this piece of work. Um, and I can't under, understate the importance of the governance and that seems to be consistent in what you've been hearing today, but also elevating the profile of MET, not only in the hospital, but certainly my role within um, Victoria and Safer Care Victoria is to elevate um, the profile of MET at a state level as well. Um, I think the key thing is, and where you're uniquely placed in a regional centre, is building better relationships with the wards. And so what a number of uh, the ICUs managed to do was to really break down that barrier. So what, really understand what, what is it and have very frank conversations. Why aren't you calling us or why are you standing back when we, when we arrive? And so they really started to really um, uh, build trust and also tailor how they did their resourcing and um, education for the wards and so that sort of informal relationship was really beneficial in trying to uh, roll out initiatives rather than sort of being the ICU and we know everything. Um, so that's been, that's been really great. Um, that's all I wanted to share with you around that. There was one other thing I, I did, um, I didn't put it in the presentation but we, we did actually fund 
uh, Mildura Hospital, which was in the top uh, corner, to do a telehealth piece of work. Because they're 600 kilometres away from Melbourne, uh, they are closer to Adelaide, but it costs about 28000 to move a patient from Mildura to Adelaide, and that's just cost prohibitive. So um, basically what we've uh, done is uh, supported them with about 400 thousand to do telehealth. But more broadly, what we want to do is build a model of care for chronic complex patients across the state. So we will use this as an example. Barwon Health um, have done an exceptional job in this space, and particularly around paediatrics. But we just think um, there is a lot of value in providing support for the second opinion um, and also building capability. And, that, and you're absolutely right, Fiona, that can seem really intimidating to medical staff. Um, you know, big city hospitals got all the answers and um, will tell us what to do. But the opportunities are far, far outweigh um, those concerns of threat around that. So I think I'm hoping we will have something more to present around that um, next year. So thank you very much.